Hello and welcome to the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center webinar titled NASA's X-57 Maxwell All-Electric Aircraft. My name is Steve Redifer and I'm the Director of the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center and today we have the privilege of hosting Mr. Sean Clark for this presentation. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center. The DTIC IAC mission is to collect, synthesize, produce, and disseminate scientific and technical information to the DOD and federal government users, and this webinar is made possible through DTIC sponsorship. I'd also like to thank all of you all for taking time out to join us today during these challenging times. A, full, a few housekeeping notes as we begin. Please note that all lines have been muted. If you have questions during the webinar, they can be submitted using the attendee chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. We're going to work to save the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation to go over those questions and discuss them. However, if we run out of time, we'll make note of all remaining questions and post responses after the conclusion of the brief. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded. So a link for the recording as well as the slides will be available at our website, www.hdiac.org, for later download. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Mr. Sean Clark. Sean is a Senior Research Systems Development Engineer at NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center. He is the Principal Investigator for NASA's X-57 Maxwell Aircraft Electric Propulsion Technology Demonstrator, and a member of NASA's Electrical Power Systems Capability Leadership Team. Before joining NASA, Mr. Clark was a Senior Operations Engineer at several U.S. Bureau of Reclamation hydro Hydroelectric Power Plants. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering at the University of Florida Gainesville. Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. I'm really excited to share the, the work we're doing on the NASA X-57 project with you guys. So uh, the X-57 is NASA's first uh, piloted, in inhabited X-plane in about 20 years. And we've had uh, a lot of experience with, with X-plane research programs over the years, and we've got a couple partnerships with the DOD right now, including X-56. Um, but this is a, a return to putting test pilots in the seat at NASA. So it's really exciting, and, and we're really excited to bring the uh, the new electric propulsion technology into flight with, with some of our research. So I've got a, I've got a lot of slides here. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the technology that we're using in order to enable this, this new aircraft capability and some of the potential impacts it can have in, in the marketplace and in other vehicle uh, segments as well. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, so why are we here? Where did we start? The, the X-57 program uh, basically kicked off out of an interest in distributed propulsion. And distributed propulsion, we're, we're using uh, a kind of an interesting definition for that. Um, we're, we're studying how we can take the, the, the propulsion technologies, the electric motors and propellers in this case, and put them on the aircraft in a way that, that fundamentally changes the way you can design the aircraft. It, it either brings specific benefits to aircraft systems or enables uh, new aerodynamic performance or, or something along those lines where the, the electric propulsion system gives the, the aerospace designers a new tool for, for aircraft layout. Um, this, this example on the right on this slide of the, the P-59 and the P-63 is kind of interesting. It's the, there's a couple lessons you could take from this. The, the, the jet age hadn't quite arrived in, in 1942 when, when these two airframes were, were designed and first flown. Um, the, the P-59 had these fancy new jet engines but didn't get much better range, didn't get much better performance. Um, used a lot more fuel than the more traditional piston engine uh, platform with the P-63. And, and the U.S. didn't end up buying very many P-59s. But that technology did grow out into a whole new industry. So this is one of the first turbine aircraft um, that the U.S. Air Force had, had started to use. And so um, the initial rollout doesn't always look like the, the most optimal application, and it's very important to size your propulsion technology to your mission and to your airframe. And 
uh, it could grow into something. And that's what we're seeing with the electric propulsion technologies as well. Very bright. <laughs> so the XC7 Maxwell is, is using electric propulsion technologies instead of piston or turbine engines. Um, in order to make the six planes as affordable as possible and, and, and get as much research done in the budget that we have, we're actually basing it on a an off-the-shelf GA airplane, a Techman G2006 T. This is a four-seat airplane. It's an Italian uh, design from, from the Techman company. Uh, it's got a gross takeoff weight of about 2,700 pounds. We're, we're actually increasing that a bit for, for some of the technology that we're using with, with some natural rigorous analyses. But it's got a, a, a pretty good uh, internal volume and it's got a high wing. So it's, a, it's an ideal uh, test bed for, for these types of technologies that I'll be showing you over the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. One of the things we're trying to do with the X57 project is, is raise the, the technology readiness of electric propulsion technologies in general. So the, the electric motors, the inverters, the, the battery systems needed to power these things. Um, there are early versions of this technology in the marketplace already, but in order to start to roll this out to uh, mass market where the public will be exposed to it, uh, we'd like to help make sure that the the industry is able to, to retire technology risks and, and do this in a safe way. So that's one of the main goals of XFC7 is to share the design and readiness process that we're, we're following uh, at NASA in order to help uh, kickstart the, the commercial industry and, and help support the FAA as they're starting to certify these vehicles. Uh, it's a pretty distributed project, X57. So I'm I'm calling from California. I work at NASA uh, Armstrong Flight Research Center in Southern California. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of design partnership from NASA Langley. When a lot of our, our main aircraft design team is is out in Virginia, um, and then a lot of our analysis team is at NASA Glenn in Ohio. So it's a multi-center uh, partnership between the, the NASA Research Center. <clears throat> um, we also have heavy participation from uh, small businesses. So a lot of the work, all of the integration work is being done on a small business innovative research contract. And the con contract is Empirical Systems Aerospace out in San Luis Obispo, California. And, and they've uh, let subcontracts out to um, many other small businesses across the country. Um, so just to step through a couple of them, scale composites you may have heard of is a, an airframer nearby here uh, in, in the Mojave Desert. And they did the, the integration of the electric propulsion technology for their initial phase. Um, Joby Aviation designed our cruise motors and our cruise motor controllers. And, and I'll be talking a lot more about those. And Zone 5 designed our new high performance wing that I'll be telling you about. So it's a, an all composite wing. Um, with a very high aspect ratio. Um, or I'm sorry, that's experimental. And then Zone 5 did our, um, is, is in the middle of doing our design for their new high lift motor system, which is a highly distributed um, propulsion augmentation device. Um, battery technology turned out to be a challenge for this project that we, we had expected was already retired in the marketplace, but um, we ended up putting a lot of research into it, so I'll show you some of the progress we've made there, and that's been in partnership with the Israel and Electric Power System. And then um, TMP Technologies is our, our software validation site out in West Virginia, along with Techman, the, the airframer that I mentioned earlier. So, electric propulsion technologies are really exciting. Um, one of the things that, that you've got to decide when you start to roll out these new technologies excuse me, is what benefits are you looking for? Uh, on, on this airframe, we decided to pursue a, a cruise performance benefit. So uh, what our designers at, at Langley did is they, they started with a, a traditional wing uh, and, and 
bounded by the wingspan and, and footprint of the original Peckman and, and tried to optimize that wing for, for the cruise condition, for high speed cruise. Um, and so when you do that, you're able to, to get a lot of the benefit just by, by shifting the LLVD curve to the right on our, on our diagram here. Um, so that the actual operating point of the aircraft is, is much closer to the, to the peak performance point of the wing. So that's, that's kind of low hanging fruit and, and not too revolutionary. But um, one of the other things we did with that wing is we, we optimized the airfoil to take advantage of putting our propulsion system at the wing tip. And so by integrating the, these lightweight, reliable electric motors at the wing tip, we're able to, to directly impact the, the vortex drag that uh, normally forms there. And so that's, that's a key uh, optimization constraint on the, on the airfoil itself. Um, and so that gets us an, uh, another uh, increment in, in cruise efficiency. Um, the other challenge though, is when we optimize a wing like this for, for cruise, we, we've got such small wing area that takeoff and landing speeds are, are greatly impacted. And so the, the stock aircraft has a, a stall speed of, of something like 62 knots. Um, our new wing would have a stall speed of, of in the neighborhood of 80 knots uh, if we didn't do anything else. But that's where we, we've introduced a, a high lift system also using electric propulsion, using some other electric motors that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about. And that system actually um, at low speed flight is able to recover that low speed performance on the wing, even though it's a very small wing area. So that's a, a critical technology uh, benefit from the system. Um, let me make sure I've covered everything there. One, one other uh, note from this chart that's kind of interesting as well is the, the installed benefit of the propulsion is uh, the installed impact of the propulsion is actually a benefit on our, on our new wing. So the, the solid lines are the unpowered performance. Uh, so the, the original wing in black and the new wing in blue. When you install the propulsion system, the wing performance is compromised a little bit because of the way the, the propellers interact with the airfoil. With our new wing, because we've got that vortex uh, uh, disruption uh, effect from the, the wing tip mounted propulsion, we're actually able to see an improvement in the aerodynamic performance of the wing because we've designed the wing to take advantage of that. And so we actually get uh, a slight increase in wing performance depending on the, on the operating conditions. So it's a, it's a really exciting technology. It's unproven. So we're, we're hoping to evaluate that during flight test of, of the X-57. Um, I mentioned there was a much smaller wing, so we're, we're trying to be fair and keep our new wing in the footprint of the original wing. Um, and that, that gets tricky when you've got your, your uh, new propellers mounted all the way up the wing tip. So we actually pulled the wing in a little bit more just so that the, the entire footprint is within the original wing. So on this picture here, you can see the, the, the blue outline is a stock Technum G2006C with a, a 37 foot wingspan. And the, the gray wing is the new high performance wing that we've designed with the, the, the primary propulsion out at the wing tip and then our distributed high lift pr propulsion uh, spread out along the wing. So that, that's a, the small, small pause bar spread along the wing. But the total area reduction, we're, we're at about 40% of the original wing size. And, and that really just comes down to optimizing it for, for that cruise condition. Um, so a side effect of, of that, that cruise optimization is, is the, the area reduction leads to a lot less skin friction drag. And so we get, we get some performance benefit directly from that as well. Um, but we also end up with much higher wing loading, which is kind of interesting. So we're expecting that the, the breast sensitivity for this aircraft will be much lower. We'll, we'll have a, a ride quality that's, that's comparable to, to much larger aircraft traditionally. Whereas uh, if, if you've ridden in GA aircraft, you, if, if you have a weak stomach, you, you can certainly get, get knocked around a little bit and, and find that the experience uncomfortable. But, um, it could be that these technologies enable us to, to improve ride quality as well, even when that wasn't a, a primary goal. Um, 
Um, okay, so I've got a little video here to, to look you up. This is kind of an interesting uh, description of, of the way we're phasing the project. So we're, we're laying out the project in a, uh, a phased approach so that we can um, roll out the technologies in a safe way because we're, we're putting these propulsion systems at the wing tip of an aircraft, which is a really challenging uh, installation location for, for your primary propulsion system. So um, we actually started with uh, what we call mod one. So I'll, I'll play the first clip of the video here. A little bit slow for me, so hopefully you guys are seeing it. So mod one is basically the traditional aircraft. So if I pause it there, it's, it's using the, the Rotex uh, 912 S engine. They're they're 100 horsepower each. Uh, installed in the in the Techman designed wing. This is basically an off the shelf aircraft that we we rented one and, and instrumented it so that we could get performance data out of it. We uh, we measured the fuel flow and added a bunch of, of Aero sensors and flew it around our test range here at Edwards Air Force Base so that we could understand the the models that we were building for for the, the baseline comparison of the airframe. And then in in mod two, it's basically the same aircraft. You can almost can't see the difference, but we've switched out the nacelle for uh, electric motors and motor controllers in place of those Rotax engines. And, and this is the version of the aircraft we're building right now. So this is this is in the hangar out at NASA Armstrong on site at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, we plan to flight test this in, in about a year. Everything's up in the air right now as we're, as we're dealing with current events, but we're, we're in the integration phase and getting ready to um, go into the, the full system test and then taxi test and flight test of, of this MOS 2 configuration. So it's the same wing, but with the, the electric propulsion system installed. And then one of the bigger technologies here as well is the battery system. So this, this aircraft is about 300 pounds heavier than the, the stock aircraft because we've installed our battery system in the back seat in the cargo area. So then the, the more exciting flights for, for research come up. So mod three and four are actually combined now. Mod three is is testing the cruise system on our new wing out at the wingtips, and then mod four is that same new wing with that same cruise system at the wingtips, but with the twelve small motors uh, distributed along the wing, so that we have this um, uh, high lift capability in low speed flight. And so that wing has been built, and and uh, those motors are in design process right now. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that as as we go through some of the technology slides. So if I if I say mod one two three four, I just wanted wanted you guys to have that um, up front there, so you understand what I'm talking about. Mod two is the is the electric version, and then mod three and four is the the new research wing with the propulsion at the wing tips, and and then eventually distributed the propulsion. All right, waiting for the slide to show up here. Okay, great. So, so as I said, we're we're working on mod two right now. Um, one of the, the the primary motivation for mod two was with a, as I said, raising that TRL level for for the electric motors, for the motor inverter system, for the battery system, so that we would have enough confidence to put our test pilot in the air with these systems driving from the wingtips. And so it's it's a risk reduction phase and allows us to go through an airworthiness process with these new technologies. Um, some of the new technologies that are, are critical have, have some impact in the marketplace already. There, there are some uh, experimental electric aircraft in the U.S. market that are using batteries. Um, there, there's a few more uh, certification routes in Europe right now, but um, setting the battery standards for for piloted aircraft for inhabited aircraft is is a pretty critical activity for for us, and so feeding back to the regulators what we're learning about the the battery safety trades that that manufacturers will have to make is is pretty critical. 
Um, so this has turned into a pathfinder for for that regulation approach. Even though NASA is a is a self certifying agency, we we do our own airworthiness certification for our research aircraft. Uh, it's analogous to what the FAA would do in in the commercial and so we're we're hoping that we can um, help the FAA leverage a lot of the experience we're having and and understand some of the risks and hazards that we're we're working through. So that's been a, a, a nice early benefit from the Mod 2 uh, phase of the project. So in Mod 2, we've, we've got a few technologies rolling out. One is the, the cruise motors themselves. So um, when we started the project a few years ago, we, we didn't really have anything in the marketplace that, that we could just drop in to the, to the vehicle design at our operating point. So we ended up doing a, a design effort with Joby Aviation, who's been designing uh, comparable motors for, uh, for similar applications for over the last few years. And, and they're actually going on to, to spin that into their own platform that they're, they're hoping to bring to market in the coming years. Um, we had to establish new test standards for cruise motors. So the, the FARs, the, the regulations for certifying Power plants on aircraft didn't have any uh, provisions for for electric motor uh, certification, um, and so we had to to in, read between the lines on on FAR 33 on on how you would certify a piston or a turbine engine and come up with a certification approach that would make sense for electric motors and make sure that not only were we not over testing uh, with with um, uh, certification steps that are specific to to uh, fuel burning engines, but also not missing any tests that were, would be critical to new um, screening that would be needed for electric motors. Um, we're also working through maintenance standards for our electric motors. So this is this is a new technology, and, and we've got uh, highly skilled aircraft uh, electricians and and mechanics on our aircraft that that need to know how do they ensure that the aircraft is is ready for operations the next day. What what uh, parameters on the aircraft that they need to be watching in order to make sure that um, the, the technology is, is uh, reliable enough for another flight. Um, we've had some challenges directly with these motors. So, so the, the motor design that we, we worked through with Joby is um, it's fully air-cooled and it's direct drive. So there's some challenges there for an electric motor design perspective because it's a, a very low speed uh, electric machine. Um, it's also um, uh, so direct drive. There's no gearbox. We wanted to make sure that there is uh, very few moving parts so that we we could work through the failure modes um, on a, on our lightweight project without having a lot of um, redundancy needed and 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 um, working through the the um, failures that would be uh, potential from uh, a gearbox. Um, so this uh, this design has actually been published. Joby wrote a nice paper and published it in the in the AIAA Aviation Forum in 2017. And, and steps through how they optimize the the footprint of the motor, the the mass and volume uh, allocation we gave them to meet the requirements. And in how you design electric motor with with those kind of constraints, and so that was a, a really nice research product from from this work. Um, we did find that as you build these technologies and put them into a a flight line environment, that some of the the design techniques and, and fabrication techniques that they were using were insufficient for uh, that that new environment, and so the. Um, some of the, the crimps, some of the um, interconnects between the motors, some of the way that the motor mounts to the aircraft, we, we had to go back and, and do another design iteration that we're just wrapping up now. So it's been, it's been a really interesting experience and um, we're, we're really happy to be, to be able to learn those lessons before flight. And, and it, it's a testament to the, to the screening program that we've put in place that we've been able to um, get those design improvements made early on. Let me skip here. 
So coupled with the motor design is the, the motor controller design. So this is an, an inverter system that takes the, the DC power from the batteries and turns it into uh, AC waveforms, basically, that go into the electric motor. And it's a pretty critical piece of technology because it needs to, to be able to handle the, the full speed and voltage range of the, the power bus, but also needs to be able to respond to the, the pilot command as he moves the, the throttle levers around. And so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex electronic device. Um, we're actually using silicon carbide MOSFETs, which are high band gap switches, basically. They enable us to chop up the, the DC power into the EC waveform very efficiently, um, which is critical when you've got the, uh, such high power applications. So, so this box is about 20 inches long by, by an inch and a half by about six inches or so. And it's capable of, of converting uh, up to 80 kilowatts of power. And, and so getting that, that level of power conversion with high enough efficiency that the, the rejected heat doesn't um, disrupt the entire process is, is a pretty critical challenge. And, and the silicon carbide technology um, is absolutely essential for that. We wouldn't be able to do this with traditional MOSFETs. Um, so that, that's that been uh, an area of, of intense research. We're also developing this as a level one safety rated software so that uh, we have absolute assurance that when the, the pilot asks for uh, a level of torque from the motor, this, this system will uh, understand that, make the right choices and, and make sure that the, the uh, motor forces are, are appropriate and, and not apply forces when it shouldn't and not fail to apply forces when it should. So that's, that's been another area of, of intense development. We're actually rewriting some of the, the executive software um, in-house at NASA just to make sure that we've got absolute understanding of, of every uh, state and phase of the, of the software path so that we're, we're able to, to certify it so that that um, highest level of, of airworthiness that, that NASA has. Um, similar to the, to the motors, I've got a slide here on, on technology challenges that we've, we've overcome. So um, packaging all of this, this 80 kilowatt conversion into this little box has been um, a, a big challenge. We're moving a lot of, a lot of volts and amps through here and um, making sure we've got the right clearance to, to handle that as everything gets closed up has, has been a bit of a challenge. And you can see in this picture on the top right, we actually had some arcing from our, our DC uh, link board up to our, our AC bus bar board. Um, and so it was a, it was a lesson in, in design techniques for, for these types of applications. Since then, we've actually even discovered some, some more failures in the silicon carbide MOSFETs themselves. So this has been pretty critical. And when, when this design was uh, was done in 2017, the state of the art for, for MOSFET modules, there, there was a, a first generation out from the major uh, um, solid state electronics manufacturers. And um, as we went through the, the formal, uh, thermal and vibration testing to, to make these boxes ready for flight testing this year, we, we started to find failures in our MOSFETs that were related to uh, the vibration environment. And so it turns out this first generation MOSFET uh, was not able to withstand the, the flight environment um, and actually pretty benign flight environment that we had, we had uh, simulated on our vibration table. And so we went through a lot of, of design revision and, and study and we took apart a lot of these, these MOSFET modules and, and studied the way that the dyes were mechanically mounted and, and tried to make sure that there wasn't uh, a fundamental design flaw with the technology. Um, and, and the conclusion is, is that the, the, the packaging of the silicon carbide MOSFETs has uh, improved quite a bit over the years. The original generation just was not laid out in a way that would be robust for flight applications. They, they always worked great during our ground test events and uh, when sitting on a bench, but when we started to put them in uh, application where the, they needed to be a little bit more rugged, they were just not appropriate. 
so we're we're in the process of of retesting with a a later generation model that uh, seems to be passing all of our initial testing. We've we've been able to put it through uh, our our vibration and, and protovibe qualification testing and proven that our, our replacement modules that are that are um, a little bit more mature technology have been working really well. So we're, we're right on the cutting edge of this technology, but it's been uh, quite a challenge. Um, one, one thing I'll point out, I, I, I see a question in, in the chat, the, the redundancy of the system is pretty critical to this technology as well. So we've got two motors on the aircraft and, and in mod three and four, those, those are gonna be installed at the wingtips. And so that's a, a pretty critical application. And, and someday these technologies, I, I strongly believe will be reliable enough that that will be an appropriate location. I wouldn't put anyone but a high performance test pilot in an aircraft like that right now. Um, but that's why we're doing this research in, in order to help raise the, the, the readiness and reliability of this technology. In order to, to help round that corner a little bit, we've actually built our motors with uh, as two three phase motors. They, they have six phases wired in instead of a single three phase motor. And that way we're able to use one of these inverters for each set of three phases. And so we, we basically have two uh, isolated powertrains from two separate batteries through two separate uh, uh, power transmission lines through the wing to two separate inverters into two separate motor windings before they, they drive the same mechanical rotor. So that's a, a really key um, redundancy capability that, that's it's not uncommon in the marketplace. It, it's, it's, it's starting to get out there a little bit more, but um, it's absolutely essential when you start to put these technologies in critical locations like the wingtip. Um, so I mentioned batteries earlier. We we had expected when we started the project that uh, with you know looking around, especially in California, there were so many electric cars out on the on the roads that battery technology would be ready for for this type of experiment. And and we were, we're really researching motor and wing design options and didn't, didn't really expect to have to do a lot of research into battery development. Um, so we, we spec'd out a battery system with uh, a moderate energy density. We, we set aside, I think it was originally about 690 pounds and, and we overshot that a little bit. So our battery system's at about 860 pounds. Um, and that provides us with uh, 54 kilowatt hours uh, nameplate, which, which means we can rely on about 47 kilowatt hours of, of available energy when you, when you take into account that the discharge limits and, and degradation over time. Um, and, and that includes a 30% a packaging overhead, which is fairly aggressive actually, normally um, for, for the types of safety um, requirements that I'll, I'll talk to you about, you'd need a lot more packaging to, to encase the batteries, but we're, we're able to do that with only um, so for every pound of lithium cells, we've got another third of a pound of, of aluminum and, and uh, hardware around it. Um, thermal management has, has been a challenge. So, so everything on this aircraft is air-cooled, the battery system included. We're, we're actually planning to chill our batteries before flight so that as they warm up throughout the, the operation, they, they stay in the ideal operating range. And, and have high performance, but also don't get anywhere near the, the thermal runaway thresholds that, that um, I'll talk to you about. Um, battery management software is, is another critical technology. So we, we really need to understand the, the state of the batteries, the health of the batteries. This has been something that um, can be confusing if you're, if you're a new electric aircraft owner in the marketplace is how, how full is your fuel tank? It, it's a little bit worse than, than in an electric car where it might say you've got 100 miles range left, and, and then a minute later, say you're down to 80 miles range because you're you're using the, the accelerator a little, accelerator a little bit more. Um, those effects are are amplified for aircraft because you can go from from almost no power in a descent to um, much more than than standard cruise power in a climb. And so, understanding how much energy is left in the tank is is uh, really critical. Um, uh, human factors 
feature that, that we're hoping to understand as we go through this and, and really study the, the state of charge algorithms in the battery system. Um, so as I mentioned, there was no, no off-the-shelf battery system available to us. Uh, what we ended up designing was with, with electric power systems, which was an, a new company at the time, uh, and, and DSR, our prime contractor, we designed a, a uh, box shown here that's about 100 pounds. It would hold about 640 of these 18650 cells. So if, if you haven't seen these, these are cylindrical cells. They're shaped kind of like a, a double A cell, but they're about 30% longer and 30% larger diameter. And they're lithium, so they're, they're different lithium uh, chemistries, different uh, anode cathode com combinations to get different energy density and um, thermal properties. So we were able to fit about 640 of those, and each one of them stores about three amp hours. Um, so if I go to the next slide, I've got a video of a, of a thermal runaway test that we did. Um, so I'll set that up for you for a second. The, the thermal runaway test is a test to make sure that if any one cell has a, a design flaw, has a manufacturing defect inside the, the cell where it develops an internal short, and, and that can happen well after acceptance testing. This could happen in the middle of a, of a flight campaign because the, the way these, these internal pieces of FOD will, will migrate around as the, the lithium ions move around, it's, it's kind of unpredictable. So you, you really need to, to plan for individual cells having a failure. But um, we want to make sure that if a cell has a failure, that it, the neighboring 18650 cell doesn't also have a failure, because because then that turns into a cascade where you've got one triggering the next, triggering the next. And and um, it's, it's critical that that doesn't happen, because being able to to contain a failure of that size is, is totally challenging. <laughs> So it, it, let's see if we can queue up this video. The, the, this is a test we did. This had about 320 cells installed. Um, so it was, it was half populated. Um, the box weighed a little over 50 pounds, even though it was, it was our 100-pound box. Um, we did this out at a, a test site in New Mexico um, just to, to contain whatever event would happen in case that the, the propagation wasn't prevented. Um, so I'll go ahead and play, and I won't talk because there's a lot of sound on this. So I'll, I'll pause it and, and, and point out some things there, see if I can get the video to back up. So, so we didn't contain the, the propagation event, as you can see. The um, the initial cell we were heating it with a uh, with nichrome wire, basically toaster wire wrapped around one of the cells, and um, it it went into thermal runaway and caused the, the neighboring cell. There we go, um, and ended up having uh, that chain reaction happen over about five hours. We, we, were, we, were, we had to go to lunch and wait for it to, to, to burn itself out while we left the, the cameras going and left the, the techs standing by um, because it was, it was just a, a, a total um, failure of the propagation prevention technology. So, so thanks, John. If we can go back to the, to the um, slides. The, um, the result of this was we had to go back and redesign the uh, the technology from the ground up, basically. So if I if I go to the next slide, we actually started using um, what the state of the art was from from NASA research that we we're doing for the space station. So NASA designs our own batteries for the the space station uh, itself, and then also the astronaut EVA suits. And the the astronauts have these multi tools that are kind of like a cordless drill that they use during during EVAs, and and those are custom batteries that are built up from these 18650 cells as well. So the picture in the top left is a is a test cell for the the latest generation of of those NASA batteries, and you can see the 18650 cylindrical cells um, embedded in a, an aluminum block. Basically, we have this interstitial substrate where we can install each of the cells. 
and and put very small gaps. The the, the block walls between the, the closest points in the cells is is as small as I think it's about 0.4 millimeters. And so the um, putting that technology in place for the, for this battery allows for any one of those cylindrical cells to have an internal failure from a manufacturing defect or from a, a, a workmanship closeout defect or from an assembly defect, whatever it is, and prevents it from uh, spreading to adjacent cells because that aluminum wall, not only does it shield the, the initial event where there could be flame or, or hot electrolytes escaping from the cell, but it also distributes the heat. And so that turns out to be a key technology from, from the NASA research that we've done down at the Johnson Space Center is by, by making sure that the, the cells are able to reject their heat into the rest of the pack and spread that heat thinly enough that the neighboring cells don't um, any one individually get over a thermal threshold um, we're able to make this this uh, technology work in a safe way. So that's been been really critical. So so what EPS did is they took that design technique and built uh, um, test cells, test uh, units, um, like in the bottom left picture there, and and triggered cells into runaway over and over, and eventually came up with a design where they were able to use a heater cartridge that that had the same temperature profiles. So that was a, a really useful. Um, uh, design technique to get it to go faster. Um, and then eventually, once we got all of the um, um, packaging figured out at that subcell level that holds 20 cells, we're able to build that up into our modules. And our modules are now designed for 160 cells each so that you can see them um, mocked up in the aircraft, aircraft on the bottom right. Um, and then the actual, the, the initial test run of modules is in the top right. Um, and so they're about 51 pounds each, and they hold 160 of these 18650 cells that are three amp hours each. And um, each one has a terminal voltage of, of as much as about 60 volts. So they're, they're something that we can handle. Our techs can, can move them into the aircraft at 60 pounds. It's, it's reasonable to, to mount it in the aircraft. And it's also a small enough package that um, we can we can handle the thermal loads on the skin without having to worry about any one cell triggering its neighbors into thermal runaway. So, um, if I switch to the next slide here, um, this is the new design. We did another test uh, at our, our new test facility that EPS built up in Utah. They're they're actually up in northern Utah at the university there. Um, this, this is, I have a video of this. It, it, you can't see anything moving, so there's, there's not really any point in showing it. But um, on, the, on the thermal camera, you can see what happens when we trigger. The, the worst case cells are always the ones in the corner because they have the fewest neighbors and the, the, the least um, opportunity to reject heat to the rest of the pack. But um, we're able to put uh, dummy cells in those corners that, that we can artificially trigger into a runaway. And, and when they go into runaway, verify that all the neighboring cells don't also go into runaway. They're, they're still able to hold a charge. You wouldn't obviously want to use the battery after that, but it, it didn't have a runaway event. We didn't see any smoke or fire. We saw this um, heat on the surface with the thermal camera, but that was all you could see in the room at the time. There, there's no noise, no, no sparks. It was, it was a, a huge improvement. Um, so that's one of the technologies that I think is, is really critical for, for the, the private sector as well. Is, um, there are not a lot of batteries in the marketplace that have this feature where the um, runaway event is prevented from one cell to another. And if, if you're not going to be able to prove that, then uh, a certification uh, package is going to have to show that the the, the worst case runaway, runaway event that is credible, if that means all of the, all the cells in an enclosure go into runaway, that needs to be contained in an aircraft so that the, that fireball doesn't escape into the aircraft. And if you're doing that for, for more than a few dozen cells, it gets really intractable because there's so much energy in, in these lithium cells. We're using uh, lithium uh, NMC, nickel manganese cobalt, uh, electrolyte, which is kind of middle of the road uh, energy density, um, lithium polymer, lipo cells that you might see on, on like hobby grade aircraft, 
have even more energy density. And so if, if you're really gonna pack these cells into um, an aircraft, you need to have a containment system that's matched to your, your worst case failure. And, and if your containment system is gonna be less than thousands of pounds, then you need to find a way to, to exclude uh, propagation failure. So that, that's kind of the conclusion of our battery research. Um, so just to, to wrap up, I'll go through a couple other technologies real quick. The electric propulsion system is highly complex. We're gonna end up with uh, 14 motors on this aircraft and actually 16 motor controllers on this aircraft. And so we need to be able to give the pilot information about his vehicle without overwhelming him. Um, and so a lot of the displays we're developing will be very interesting uh, and, and should help in the marketplace. We're actually using some of the design techniques that Pipistrol uses, which is a, a small Slovenian company that's been building electric airplanes for several years. Um, and, and we actually are, are um, um, cooperating with them a little bit on the display design techniques. So that's a, a nice opportunity for collaboration as well. Um, quick update on the Mod 2 vehicle. This is out at NASA now. This was, this was at Scales Composites until last summer, and then we delivered it out to NASA and we're doing the final integration uh, testing uh, before we go into to taxi test and flight test um, uh, about a year after we're able to, to get back in there. Um, I think I've covered most of this. I really wanna to get to a couple other technology pieces. So mod three and four is where we've got our, our high performance wing. And, and so that's really critical. It's taking all these same technologies that I just described, the motors, the batteries, the, the motor controllers, and putting them in, in the really exciting uh, application positions on the aircraft. Um, we do need a new wing for that. So we've got uh, an all composite wing designed by Experimental and, and integrated by ESRO out in California. Um, it's, a, it's a floating spar design where the, the main spar transfers all the loads through ribs to, uh, to forward and rear spars that inter intersect with the, uh, the fuselage itself. And so it's kind of a complicated uh, load path that's more like a glider wing. Um, so that's a little bit uh, innovative for this type of aircraft, but it allows us to, to fit all of the um, power handling and instrumentation and control cables into the wing. So we need to move uh, as much as 250 kilowatts out of our batteries mounted in the fuselage up into the to the wing nacelles where the motors are. And so we need a lot of volume for, for wiring there. Um, I, I mentioned earlier in mod one where we've got a, a flight sim developed and, and this has been critical for us as well. We've got a, a very nice simulator capability out at NASA Armstrong. Uh, our, our Langley team is designing the flight sim itself and, and making sure that the, the sim uh, physics map to the to the aircraft performance that we see in the mod one flights and that we see from ground testing with our new propulsion system. And then we put all of that into the piloted sim at Armstrong. So the pilots can get in there multiple times a week and sit down and understand how the technology makes the aircraft behave and how the technology works when it starts to fail. So that's been really critical is um, what it, what is the response uh, amplitude need to be if we have a motor failure, if we have a controller failure, if one of our prop uh, pitch controllers fails, the, the pilots are, are exceedingly familiar with that even before getting in the airplane itself. And I think my last technology slide here is the, the motors. I'm waiting for it to update on my screen. I don't know if you could see it yet. Um, yeah, there we go. So our high lift propulsion system is also a, a pretty tricky design. We, we needed this system to, to augment the, the airflow over the wing at low speed conditions, but we needed to get out of the way at cruise. And so we, we have this folding propeller uh, design that enables the, the uniform flow increase over the wing when we spin up these motors. And then when we stop, the propellers will retract in and, and snug up against the nacelle so that they're in a actually pretty low drag configuration for cruise. It, it looks like a pretty messy wing, but the, because we've mounted the nacelles low on the wing and, um, and been able to store these propellers uh, very cleanly, the, the, drag is, the drag penalty in cruise is actually not that bad. So that's been pretty critical. And, and we're, in the, we're right around CDR. We had an initial CDR for this design 
um, in November, and we have a couple open items that we're still working. So we're going to do a, a small delta review in the coming months, and then go into fabrication for this system uh, this summer. So uh, I have one more video to show you, just to kind of wrap up and see how the the technology all comes together when when you put all these systems on the aircraft. Um, so it's kind of a it, it's it's really exciting because we're able to use electric propulsion technology to to really change the way uh, we think about aircraft design. Um, so we end up with this high performance wing that's got a, a pretty short take. It, it basically mimics the original GA aircraft, but uses once you fold up the propellers in flight for the high lift system, we're in about uh, one fifth the energy usage uh, per mile traveled at cruise that the original aircraft would use. Um, it takes a little bit more energy to, to climb. It takes a little bit um, more energy to charge the batteries that, that I'm not counting when I say one fifth, but, but when you look at the energy that we carry into the air and how much of it we use per mile, um, it's massive improvement. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, and, then, and then the last slide I'll mention just for, for you guys to bookmark is we've set up a, a technical portal for this on the, the nasa.gov slide. So if, you, so if you go to nasa.gov slash x57 slash technical, we're collecting all the research papers that we've written. We've written close to 100 papers at this point over the last three or four years, and, and we've got more coming out every conference season, basically. Um, so those are all going up on our, our technical portal here, but then we're also starting to publish things like our design reviews. And so our, uh, we've done a preliminary design review and a critical design review for the, the overall vehicle system. And um, we've completed the preliminary design review for our high lift system, and, and we're wrapping up the critical design phase there. So those design reviews, they're basically a thousand pages of, of slides describing how all the subsystems work together um, are also being published. Um, and then as we go through the, the airworthiness process, we'll, we'll be publishing all the airworthiness artifacts as well. So anything that we can help uh, accelerate industry with, if it's if it's a um, motor test program or if it's a, a maintenance plan for, for an energy converter or whatever it is, um, we'd like to get that published up here so that we can, we can help the marketplace um, take that and, and, and really get these technologies into, into the commercial sector as quickly as possible. So I'm really excited about it and, and I, I think I've got a, a little time for some questions. Thanks. Hey, Sean, this is Steve. Again, great job. Thanks again so much for that. That was a great brief. You do, you have a whole passel of questions, so we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so the first question from Philip, he asks about the choice between power cells and batteries. Power cells offer some distinct uh, advantages, you know, and batteries have their limitations. What was the rationale behind that choice? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty tricky um, optimization there because even even in the battery sector there's such a uh, wide range in energy density and volumetric uh, specific volume of the cells and so um, we ended up with uh, I think what's going to be kind of a, a universal challenge where the the ratio of how much energy you need to how much power you need is kind of critical. We, we needed quite a bit of power for, for takeoff and climb, but you don't need very much power when you're in cruise, but you want to have a long cruise uh, segment. And so you end up with having to compromise between what are, what are called energy cells and what are called the power cells. Um, we, we have kind of a middle of the road cell. We're using the, the Samsung uh, 30Q cell. If you want to, if you want to find the data sheet on that, and there's information on our on our technical portal about it as well. But that that cell is is pretty good. Samsung's got a really good reputation for manufacturing um, repeatability, and it also has a, a reasonable energy density for the package. Something else NASA really likes is the the 18650 form factor, and, and I expect the 27500 form factor is going to be similar as well. But or, or I'm sorry, 26700 form factor, um, because the, the cylindrical cells have a nice um, surface area to volume uh, relationship where they've got, a, they've got a lot of volume there for, for energy storage, but then there's also a lot of surface area in order to get that, that heat out, and, and that's been a really critical design consideration. 
Thanks, Sean. So Lee asks uh, whether you're using an AC bus or a DC bus, and then he asked you to explain a little bit about the ground new scheme, scheme for the system. Oh yeah, this is this is critical. So and this has been a, a bit of a challenge. So we're using a DC bus. We we've got our battery system has a terminal voltage as high as 537 volts. Um, it's basically 128 uh, 1860 cells in series, and and then also parallel. Um, so that bus is isolated from the aircraft, and we have isolation detection on the aircraft. So that way we can tolerate a failure of the bus, a, a short to the aircraft chassis, um, if there's only one short. And, and if we detect it, then we can shut everything down and go fix it. But if there's a, a second short, we also have uh, protection devices in place. We've got fuses on our, on our system. Um, so, so grounding is, is a challenge. We, we also separately convert that high voltage to avionics power. So we have 13 volt and 28 volt systems on the aircraft and those are, are grounded in a more traditional aircraft style. But the, the high voltage system is, is floating relative to the aircraft. So um, Mike asked about uh, considerations you guys had to make for preventing some sort of uh, electromagnetic interference. Yeah, and, and we're expecting to learn more about that if, if there is a constraint there for us in the system testing, but it hasn't really been a, a problem for us so far. We do have uh, programs in place at Armstrong to make sure that we're not radiating and, and putting anyone at risk, and so we, we, we do those tests at the bench level and then at the vehicle level. Um, but um, our, our choice for the, for the integration approach on the project was to not try to to analyze all that ahead of time because it, it's a pretty big undertaking. Instead, we've built the systems, and then as we're testing them, we're we're making sure that the the kind of best practices that we're using don't introduce anything, and then and then we can band-aid it if we have to. And we haven't really had to yet, so that's been good. We've had a couple problems with current sensors getting interference, and we've been able to get hardened current sensors, but overall, we we haven't really had much problem with that. So we had a question come in from some of our YouTube, one of our YouTube viewers, um, and he asks, how many cruise motor controllers are there? You know, one per plane, or do you have one per motor? And then there's a follow-on question for one of our any meeting viewers that asked if the CMCs were cooled uh, and how they're cooled. Yeah, great question. So the, the, for the cruise system, it's, it's two sets of windings in each motor that are electrically independent. It's basically two Y-wound motors that are inter, interweaved around each other. So um, a few of the uh, uh, stator slots are from one inverter and a few are from the other inverter and it kind of alternates around the, the circumference of the motor. And that lets us put independent inverters on each of those y, y windings. So that's, that's a really nice design technique that allows us to have a failure in an inverter, but not lose that whole motor. And in fact, you can you could drive the surviving side to even higher power. Um, so there's actually two inverters per cruise motor. On the high lift motors, there's one each, but there's 12 of them. So we can tolerate losing um, several of those before the pilot really needs to, to fly the airplane differently. Uh, for cooling of the of the system, everything's air cooled. It, it is a is a design simplification, but it also means a, a thermal complication. So the the inverter system for the motors actually is using the motor exhaust as its cooling airflow. So that's a, a pretty marginal design. The motor is something like uh, 91, 92 percent efficient, and our inverter is something like 96, 97 percent efficient. Um, so all of that heat that the motor has to reject is is warming up the air that comes out of the motor, and then the inverters are mounted right behind it. But um, we think the design will still close. We're we're working through some of the the routing right now, but um, it's it's enough that the the temperature tolerance of the inverter system is like 150 C, so it's it's able to tolerate quite a bit, and and we're able to apply margins to that and still make the design close. So um, Gabriel asks. What do you? What is the minimum number of motors um, that you would need to keep the airplane aloft in in typical weather conditions? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and, and it's really it's really important for the way we design the X plane, basically. So so uh, 
one answer could be zero. We, we've designed this airplane with a lot of experimental technologies and, and we know that the, the technologies itself are immature and may fail. And so um, that's one of the advantages of flying out at Edwards Air Force Base is we've got really long runways. And if we, if we have a problem getting to a runway, we've got huge uh, dry lake beds that we can use as uh, emergency landing locations. And so that's a critical safety feature. But um, if you want to maintain level flight or even, even have a bit of a climb, um, we're able to do that with um, certainly three out of the four crews uh, inverters working, you know, one and a half cruise motors working well. Um, probably we can do that with, with even less. We can definitely do it with, with losing an entire battery. So we've got our battery split up into two banks. And if we shut down a battery, um, half the power to, to each wing goes away, basically. And, and we're able to have controlled flight, much lower performance, but we're able to, to fly back to the runway from, from anywhere we'd be in the pattern there as well. So it, it gets really complicated when you've got 14 motors because all the different combinations that could fail um, is, is, is a, a lot of, of analysis, but we're going through that and using the, the flight simulator to help understand that as well. So I think we've got time for one last one. You showed a picture of some of the um the flight instruments that you all are working and the design of those. Uh, the question was, would there be any, uh, would those be, need to be qualified outside of NASA um, before you begin operational flight test? Uh, we, we don't have to because NASA has a very robust airworthiness process. So we're actually using, uh, th those displays are actually automotive. They're, they're used in the, the racing industry. Um, but it's nice because we're able to quickly mock up new uh, widgets and get them in front of the pilot. So it's it's kind of a, a simple uh, starter glass cockpit for our for our analog airplane. Um, but we're we're also taking them through a, a full flight qualification program. So we we put them in our um, thermal and vibration chambers. We took them up to altitude. We do all all of the isolation and functional testing, and we do pretty robust software testing as well. So. Because we've got those programs in place, we're able to um, cherry pick technologies that, that aren't already uh, intended for aircraft. That's great. Thank you so much, Sean. I, I apologize. I think there are about three of you whose question we didn't get to, but we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Sean, I want to really take time out. It's obvious you all are busy. It's obvious you got a lot going on. And uh, I certainly do appreciate you taking time out to, to do this. Um, it, we're very grateful, and I think it was a very, very uh, informative brief for all our listeners. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the slides and recording of this presentation will be made available for download at www.hdiac.org. If you're interested in learning more about the HDIAC or getting involved as a subject matter expert, presenter, or expanding your presence in our user community, Please feel free to reach out directly, and you can use the contact information that we're going to that you're going to see on the left-hand side of the screen. In addition to these monthly webinars that that we try to do a couple times a month, the HDAC also offers monthly podcasts that span the range of our eight technical focus areas. We kick out a biweekly email digest with the latest scientific and technical news in the homeland defense community, and we also provide a technical inquiry service with up to four free hours of technical consulting. So ask a question and we'll work with our subject matter experts and our staff to get you an answer. If you're active in the homeland defense community and are interested in joining our subject matter expert community, please reach out directly. Again, we cover eight technical focus areas. Um, there's a lot, a lot of good information out there. And our subject matter experts contribute in a variety of ways, including presenting webinars like what you've seen today, providing podcasts, and providing consulting as needed to respond to any of these technical inquiries that our core staff can't answer. So our contact information is included in the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. And then be sure to join us 30 April for our next webinar, and that's going to be covering radiation response given by the Guardian Centers of Georgia. If you register as a member on our website, you can subscribe to receive notifications of the webinars and the podcasts such as you've seen today. So again, Sean, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for their time today and best regards and stay well.